more and get started. Good. Um, well, hello and welcome everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. And I want to really thank our distinguished panelists for who are participating today and we'll be introducing them in just a moment. I'm David Lesher. I am the editor at Cal Matters. If you haven't heard of us, we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan statewide news organization with a mission to raise public awareness about the major issues facing California. Uh, I'm joining you from our offices in Sacramento, about a block from the Capitol, um, where we opened our doors just uh, six years ago last month. Um, this event is part of a series this year that we are very happy to co-host with the Milken Institute about the future of work. And today we're going to talk about the outlook for California small business. California has more than 4 million small businesses that represent a critical part of the state's economy and support millions of California workers. And we all know that small business was particularly hard hit when the economy was shut down due to the pandemic and that the impacts were disproportionately in areas of low income and communities of color. Today, we'll talk about what happened and what, what is being done or needs to be done to fix it and to look ahead at how this critical sector has changed. Cal Matters has reporters throughout the state covering these and other issues. So I encourage you to follow us at calmatters.org, to subscribe to our daily newsletter, and to help support this free source of quality information by making a donation. Uh, now I'm very happy to introduce our moderator for today's discussion, Nigel Dwara. Nigel is a reporter at Cal Matters and part of our California Divide project about inequality. He came to us after working at HBO and the Los Angeles Times, and he is based in Los Angeles. So Nigel, over to you. Thanks so much. And first I'm gonna introduce uh, a person who's not a panelist, but she is gonna give some remarks. Um, look, small businesses are in a tough place. Federal Reserve sur survey found that 30%, or about 9 million, do not expect to survive 2021 without more government assistance. Restaurants didn't come back, venues shuttered. Women, communities of color overwhelmingly missed out on opportunities uh, for desperately needed government intervention. So today we're gonna hear about the plans for that government intervention. In March, a year and a day after the shutdown order in California, Isabella Casillas Guzman was sworn in as the new director of the SBA. She formally served here in California as a state small business advocate under Governor Newsom. Among her duties in her new role is gonna be overseeing the Paycheck Protection Program, the Restaurant Revitalization Fund, and $15 billion in disaster grants. And also, she mixed, she very much misses Mexican food out there in DC. Isabella, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you so much, Nigel, for uh, that warm introduction, for welcoming back here in California virtually. It's good to see all these familiar names and the attendee list, and I uh, love to you know, be part of these conversations, of course, on small business, a passion area for me. Uh, so thanks so much to, uh, to Milken Institute and Cal Matters for uh, setting up these important conversations, especially on the small business front. And I think, you know, the more conversations we have together as leaders and as small business owners, uh, we can better solve some of the challenges out there and bring small businesses back, uh, you know, but also to ensure that they just continue to anchor our main streets, our business industry centers, uh, and our communities, really creating local jobs and in the local economies. And I want to give a special thanks to Eugene Cornelius. Uh, Eugene and I first met as former SBA colleagues uh, during the Obama administration, and he's a passionate advocate for small businesses and is really doing great things at the Milken Institute. So thanks so much. Uh, and to all the great panelists, I, you know, I've always admired your work and I look forward to this um, conversation that you're all going to have as you drive California forward on small businesses. Um, you know, as many of you know, and as was shared, I, I spent the first part of the COVID-19 pandemic in California as the director of the Office of the Small Business Advocate, uh, serving in the Newsom administration, really trying to, you know, discover new ways, pivot and adapt along with our small businesses to help Californians weather the unprecedented crisis and the impact that it had on our small businesses. And now I'm so proud to leverage those really 
rich experiences in California to focus on the same issues at the federal level again. Uh, and now for the 30 million small businesses and innovative startups that are the engine of our economy. And just as we are experiencing our experience in California, underserved entrepreneurs are across the United States, the smallest of the small in urban and rural areas or businesses owned by women and people of color, you know, definitely struggled to stay afloat through the pandemic and connect to relief. And through no fault of their own, you know, they were, you know, had to pick up the pieces, pivot, adapt quickly in the marketplace, uh, changing the, their whole business models in many cases. And, and no one could have predicted that type of challenge that they were going to be faced with. Um, and unfortunately, uh, because so many of them were, were left out of early federal relief uh, and faced those historic barriers you know, to capital and wealth creation, uh, many of them are still struggling to try to you know, carve their path forward to success. And so, you know, with, uh, with my new role at the SBA, I've been able to travel extensively around the country and just you know, note that there is a glimmer of hope out there. There's reasons for optimism. Our small businesses and our economy are coming back. Uh, I think thanks a lot, uh, a lot to the American Rescue Plan successes, fighting COVID and getting shots in arms. Uh, we know that that's what's going to make the difference in helping us get back together, gather at those happy hours on Main Streets or, you know, attend theater performances and, and, and be out there spending local, spending with small. Uh, but many small businesses, as we still see, are, are reeling from this unprecedented disaster and really need our help. So at the SBA, we do remain committed to delivering the billions of dollars in COVID relief. Uh, that we're tasked with and, and ensuring that we get that funding into the hands of small businesses who truly need it across all sectors from Main Street to manufacturing to professional services and all stages of the life cycle. Uh, as the voice now for America's 30 million small businesses, I, I am focused on bridging those gaps that I referenced earlier to support all of our nation's small businesses and really truly make them feel like the giants they are in our economy. I think it's been a pivotal moment where more attention has been focused on small businesses and the impact they have in our economy, which we all um, know, but I think it's, it's a time to take advantage of that and really position them for strength into the future. Um, since the pandemic began, SBA has scaled dramatically from a $40 billion you know, portfolio annually to more than a trillion, dispersing loans, grants, debt relief. Uh, and other resources to help the nation, our nation's small businesses. Uh, you know, today we're trying to leverage this attention to position our programs, really transform them to make them more customer centric, technology forward and equitable. Uh, and I've directed my staff to be as entrepreneurial as the entrepreneurs that we serve and put our customers, America's small businesses first. Uh, that customer-centric approach. We, we need to understand their needs and how they've changed uh, and meet them where they are instead of waiting for them to come to us. Uh, and we definitely need to be technology forward, you know, leveraging the fact that small businesses have adopted technology at such high rates during COVID, uh, but also move to streamline, automate for speed and efficiency within our new scaled uh, programs. And we need to do all of this course, with the Biden-Harris commitment and focus on equity in the process. So I am proud to see that we've made uh, uh, some changes, significant changes, and achieved results to that end. In 2021, 96% of the PPP loans went to small businesses 20 and under. Uh, and as well, we had strong performance in rural and LMI communities. Uh, now we're really trying to work closely with the more than 5,000 private financial partners, more partners than ever, to ensure our small businesses can actually gain forgiveness for their PPP loans. We're not done yet. Uh, you know, we also designed and implemented, I'm sure you all heard of the, um, you know, the Restaurant Revitalization Fund, and we tried to approach it from an innovative perspective and be as effective as possible, get it out swiftly uh, to distribute targeted relief to food and beverage businesses. Uh, and uh, of the 28.6 billion, uh, 18 billion of it went to underserved women, veterans, socially and economically disadvantaged businesses. You know, we've also revamped the Shuttered Venues Operator Grant Program that was established last year to help the performing arts venues and cultural institutions, which we know like, anchor so many of our communities, draw folks in. And as a result of those changes, that we've made in the past few weeks, we've awarded $5.2 billion to over 6,800 entities. We're making progress. 
And now we're working to improve the high in demand COVID IDLE, uh, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, which really truly is a strong recovery tool as it provides low cost, long term funds with deferred payments. And so we're really focused on making sure that this program works for our small businesses. Um, so far, we've delivered over 3.8 million loans for over 218 billion, um, plus an additional 3 billion has been distributed in companion grants through the targeted idle and supplemental targeted idle advance programs for um, highly impacted low income uh, community businesses. Uh, but we know that we can do better with IDLE, and uh, over the next few weeks, we're implementing changes to streamline and uh, uh, expedite the process. And so I think that'll have a, a strong impact in local communities. But we know our work is only as effective as the connection to small businesses, and I know all of you are critical in that connection to resource um, that we, we saw at a deficit in this past over a year and a half. So we are looking for new ways to get the word out that SBA has resources to help small businesses start and grow. Uh, we launched our Community Navigator Pilot Program, which is a $100 million program funded through American Rescue Plan, which will create like a hub and spoke network of trusted organizations that can be on the ground, uh, local governments and tribal entities or community champions who we expect to leverage their direct access to small businesses. Um, especially underserved small businesses, so that we can help them navigate resources. Uh, you know, I, I, I parallel them to the uh, Prometoras on uh, ACA, where we actually help uh, your neighborhood advocates and other advocates actually help connect uh, individuals uh, to the health exchanges so they can access health care. Uh, but really, the, the future of our economy really depends on our ability to connect with these small businesses to help them recover and rebuild. And at 30 million in constant births and deaths, we need everyone's uh, help in that end. Uh, but the strengthening of our small business ecosystem will better position our communities during this next stage of recovery, uh, where I'm truly excited about the opportunities that will be available to small businesses and innovative startups through the bipartisan infrastructure framework, as well as President Biden's uh, overall Build Back Better agenda. You know, they promise to bring unprecedented investments to reimagine our future economy. And so at the SBA, we're repositioning our programs to help build back better. We know that capital is critical, but market access, the revenue side of the equation is equally important, as I've always said. And these are, you know, once in a generation investments in infrastructure, innovation, R&D, manufacturing, supply chains, and well as, as well as the workforce and the care economy that you know, our small businesses depend on as well. But all of those will present great opportunities for our small businesses, and we want to make sure that they're ready uh, and uh, connected, take advantage of that. So I know that our contracting programs are you know, positioning to better support our small businesses to get ready to access that half a trillion dollar federal marketplace. Uh, you know, President Biden uh, knows that that's an important pathway to building wealth and creating jobs and strengthening our supply chains. And in fact, recently uh, announced an increase in our disadvantaged business enterprise goals uh, so that over the next five years, that translates you know, to uh, you know, an increase of 50% or $100 billion. Uh, so we're really committed to making sure that we can have an equitable access to those revenue opportunities for our small businesses. Uh, we know that uh, you know, transforming how businesses access their capital, their markets, and the networks can really help build that future economy, and SBA has a critical role to play. Uh, in, in doing so. So, uh, you know, I know President Biden always says, and I agree with this, and we all know that ideas come from everywhere and anywhere. I mean, that was what I was focused on in California with the California for All, um, looking at our inland communities uh, as well as our coast and just tapping into those ideas and supporting all those startups and small businesses to strengthen the economy. Uh, we know that America's small businesses are up to the task. I think that we, you know, we believe in that entrepreneurial spirit. That's what's foundational to our country. Uh, and so if we give them the tools, they will innovate, they will build, they'll adapt and pivot as they have been over this time. So I do look forward to all your continued great thinking on how you can help the California small businesses. It's a continuous beacon for us and hope for the future as we look at our whole nation and how we can better stimulate our, our jobs and, and our economy through small business creation and growth. 
So thanks for inviting me here. I really appreciate the opportunity and I look forward to your continued work and collaboration. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> Um, and to the participants, uh, folks, if uh, if you want to send in questions, uh, send them in um, at about one o'clock. We're gonna we're gonna break for Q and A, but I will try and keep an eye on those. So, PPP loans were intended to help small businesses, but not all small businesses. They weren't much help if you ran a small business without great bookkeeping. They weren't much help if you had less than two weeks of cash in reserve. They weren't much help if your bank wasn't already participating in the SBA primary loan program, and they weren't any help if you didn't have access to a computer. So I'm going to let our, our panelists introduce themselves, but before that, to frame what we're talking about here, we need to say what happened first. As my boss Dave says, the solution depends on how you define the problem. So to do that, I'm going to start with Lenore, who's our business owner on this panel. And uh, Lenore, I hope you're on. Um, can you take us back to the shutdown and uh, the summer of 2020 and, and just walk us through what it's been like for the past 16 months? Sure, thanks for having me. My name's Lenora Estrada, and I'm the owner and founder of Three Babes Bake Shop, um, and I'm also the co-founder of a COVID nonprofit called SF New Deal that helps small businesses um, navigate and stay afloat during the pandemic. Um, I've had my business for 10 years, and pre-COVID, we had around 30 employees. Um, we, we sell baked goods, so pies, we're famous for pies, cookies. Um, we pre-pandemic were selling mostly to big companies that offered um, like lunch and breakfast. So breakfast, pastries, and desserts to, to all of the Google campuses in San Francisco, Lyft, Twitch, like all of these kind of big tech companies that are here in the Bay Area. Um, we did a lot of catering for them. Um, and so <clears throat> in early March, actually, so this is kind of early. In early March, I realized that um, all of our companies that were um, buying from us, all of our customers were about to shut down for what they thought at that time was one to three months. So we realized that 80% of our revenue was going to zero. Um, so I sort of spent the weekend, I went to a dinner party, frankly, I went to a dinner party where um, the, the founder of, of Twitch was present and he was talking about how they were about to sort of all work from home for one to four months starting on Monday. And um, they're one of our customers. And so no one from the cafeteria had sort of called us to tell us this yet, um, but I went home immediately and started making plans to lay off almost, or to, to sort of cut hours for most of my staff. At first, I thought I would have to cut about 30% of hours. So going on Monday, I start having these difficult conversations with people. Here in the state of California, EDD will um, supplement. Um, so if you have to cut hours, you can get some of your, um, some of your unemployment. And so we sort of made plans to start doing that for people and apply immediately. And then as the day went on, more and more of our customers called to say that they were just like closing down the office for an indefinite period of time. So we went from cutting people's hours by a third to cutting people's hours by 60% to laying off um, 26 of our 30 people. Um, well, 24 of our 30 people really. And then the remaining six people we cut down to 40% time. Um, and we would have one person in the kitchen at, the time, at a time and then overlapping for one hour with the other person. We were really concerned for people's safety. Um, and so we didn't know how the virus was spreading at that time. There weren't a lot of masks available. So we sort of had like a 4 a.m. shift and then they overlapped for one hour with the person on the later shift. And that was how we did things. And um, at first we thought it was going to be, you know, one or two months. Um, it was really sad. Um, and I immediately began trying to sort of access the programs that were being announced. And I found very quickly that while a number of programs had been announced, that there was no way to apply for things. So the city of San Francisco had announced a program where um, you could get like a, a week of, of like additional sick leave. Like I paid out everyone's sick leave, even though we didn't have to do that. We paid everyone's sick leave. I mean, I was, I was certainly very concerned that people who worked for me were going to lose healthcare, not be able to afford COBRA. Um, some of them are like on the older side and Many of them are, uh, were not, like they're monolingual Spanish speakers. They didn't speak English. And here in San Francisco, we're lucky enough to have a public option for healthcare. We have something called Healthy San Francisco where anyone in San Francisco can get healthcare. Um, I previously had that healthcare. Um, so, you know, I know it's possible, but like I was concerned that my staff members were going to like get COVID waiting in line at the general to apply for, um, for Healthy San Francisco. So like really concerned that my my decisions um, and my inability to continue offering employment to these people was going to be like a life or death situation. Um, it was really tough, <laughs> like a lot of chaos. I also was pregnant at the time and had a one-year-old child. Um, 
And um, the next week, uh, my friend Emmett, the, the founder of Twitch, called and offered to donate a million dollars if I wanted to start a nonprofit to try to get relief out to the community. So I went from sort of thinking about how to support my own small business or like how to find sales someplace to really thinking on like the citywide level, what I could do to help the city of San Francisco and help small businesses here. And so we just started reaching out to community-based organizations that already were serving various populations in need and kind of connecting restaurants where we were buying meals with, um, with groups that whose food supply had been disrupted because of COVID. Um, and there are a lot of those, many people who used to receive Meals on Wheels and then all of a sudden it stopped coming because Meals on Wheels was overloaded or like the food pantries didn't have enough um, resources to sort of offer food to all the people that needed it, which was a lot. Um, a lot of people becoming newly food insecure. And so immediately we found that both there were a lot of people who need meals and many, many small businesses that wanted to participate in this program. So we had like hundreds of people sign up. Um, I didn't want it to be sort of like a one-off, you know, we're buying something from a restaurant one time. I really wanted, um, like as a food maker, I've certainly been in situations where someone orders a thousand meals and I feel like I have to say yes to the order, but like I don't have the staffing to actually um, meet that, like do that order, fulfill. Um, and so, um, and then it also it doesn't sort of allow me to, to like keep staff or anything. A one-time order does nothing for you. Um, so I really wanted to find a way to support people for a longer period of time. So anyone we let onto the program, we initially said we would support for eight weeks um, with like between four and $8,000 of revenue in sales. Um, and we wanted to really make sure we were focusing on businesses that were employing staff members um, initially, we were focusing on people that had bricks and mortars, but we later sort of expanded that reach. Um, and so we started and we went from, I mean, the first day my, my co-founder and I made 100 sandwiches at his mom's house and took them to a, um, a clinic that's part of UCSF that provides services to severely mentally ill and homeless individuals. Um, and it's called Citywide Case Management. It's a division of UCSF. Um, and then by the end of the first week, we had done a thousand meals. We were working with three restaurants. The second week we did 19,000 meals and, um, we're, uh, working with 24 restaurants. And then since then we've grown to support 200 restaurants and we've done more than 50,000 meals, like between 20 and 50,000 meals a week since March 23rd of 2020. Um, and, you know, working with all these businesses, like, you know, I'm going through it as a small business owner needing to apply for PPP. Um, trying to sort of get whatever resources there are, applying for like dozens of, of various grants and getting nothing. <laughs> you know, I've applied for the Bay Area List grant and it, like all of the grants I've applied for and like none of them have I received. Um, and at first, you know, I applied for PPP. We realized that all these businesses that are working with us, many of whom, most of whom are owned by historically underserved groups, um, you know, they really needed help with things like applying to PPP. So we, we assisted people with that. And, um, you know, when the first am amount of money was announced for PPP, um, I think four out of the 150 restaurants that were working with us got PPP, like four. And all of them were people that had sophisticated investors. None of them were, you know, owned by people of color. Um, and, you know, that was when there was the whole outroar about Danny Meyer, uproar about um, Danny Meyer restaurant group getting all this money, like sort of these bigger companies getting, um, getting large amounts of money. Um, when the second amount was announced, we really worked with people closely to try to apply, and we worked with um, with some of the, the sort of alternative lenders that aren't normal banks. Um, one of the things that was already mentioned is, you, you know, like if you are a person of color, historically you've been denied access to capital, um, like denied the ability to build wealth um, because of redlining, things like this, and and a lot of these people don't already have a relationship with a bank, and that made it really really difficult to um, to get a PPP loan. So so we actually worked with um, companies like um, Square that does payment processing uh, to apply for loans, and seventy percent of our um, of our businesses were able to get PPP in the first round um, once that second amount of funding was was released. Um, Moving on, like <laughs> it's continued to be difficult. I think um, uh, like as a small business owner myself, I've applied for, um, I've received an EIDL loan and, um, and I, I was one of the people that received an EIDL, um, one of the advanced grants. Um, can, kind of, can you clarify yes. what that is? What, what is that acronym? Oh, sure. So the SBA offered, has, offers a number of programs. Um, so um, I received a PPP loan. I received a second PPP loan. And then um, I still needed money because, you know, it, like, 
people think we're back, <laughs> we're back, but we're really not back. <laughs> like none of the business, none of the companies that buy from us have gone back to the office yet. Um, I think Google went back for the first time in a very limited way this week. Um, so, you know, that amount of revenue is still zero. <laughs> so we're still operating at about, you know, 20% of the, the previous, uh, we've, we've found other ways to kind of make up for some of the money we lost, but like we rehired people. We use that PPP money to rehire people. So like we lost $60,000 in the first quarter, $70,000 in the second quarter, you know, I'm using my PPP for that, but like at some point you can't keep going. Um, so anyway, there are other products that, that the SBA offers. Um, so there, there's the EIDL loan, which is a relatively low interest rate loan. It's 3.75% interest. Um, I've always wondered, and maybe someone can answer this for me on this call, why if um, the federal government is offering 0% um, interest like money to the financial institutions, like why I'm still paying 3.75%, but it's still low. So like, I'll take it. Um, and then additionally, there were grants. There were these $10,000 grants that you could get. Um, they were available initially, but, um, and sorry, this is kind of wonky. You would have to pay them back. And so initially I didn't apply for that and the money was then gone and then more money was made available, but, um, and it, like, it was sort of targeted for women-owned businesses, minority-owned businesses. Um, I'm Latina, I'm a, I'm a woman. Um, so like I qualified for that and I, I received that money. So that was appreciated because that's a $10,000 grant. Um, Anyway, so we're, we continue to work with all these small businesses. In, in May of last year, we started um, applying for federal contracts to be able to do community feeding here in San Francisco. And that's been a really compelling way to get money. That's been like the most compelling thing we've done, frankly, um, because like normally a big company like an Aramark, you know, someone that does like prison food or airline food, those are the people that are kind of getting big contracts to do feeding. And um, there was a, a program, Gavin Newsom's like Great Plates program, um, which was mostly FEMA funded, partly state funded, partly locally funded. Um, and the city sort of chose us to be an administrator for this program and um, or a, like a service provider. And so basically we got this big contract. We sort of used the collective power of the businesses that we're working with to apply for this contract and then broke it down into a bunch of like mini assignments. And we have this thin administrative layer of support. Um, so we have a call center that's staffed in many languages. Um, and we kind of have account reps essentially, like people who we're a nonprofit, but like we, we now have 22 people. Um, and most people are sort of in the service of small businesses getting meals out to the community. And so we've applied for a number of these things. And, and whereas like normally small businesses would never be able to participate in that stream of income, like that stream of money from the federal government, um, we're kind of making it possible for small businesses to access that money. And so that's allowed us to really grow. So we have like, um, we've distributed more than $25 million in the last year. And then we also have earned income because, you know, the other people who are getting the contracts we're getting are for-profit companies, right? They're like giving that money to shareholders and we're a nonprofit. So we just have the money left over. So we just launched a million dollar grant program where we're giving micro grants to all kinds of small businesses here in San Francisco. And Lenore, I think this is a good, good opportunity to pop in with our other panelists because oh, yeah. what, no, no, no. And, and thank you for, for, for that very detailed description. <laughs> One thing that I heard from what you were saying, and uh, we're going to bring in Gene next is, um, the ways people kind of had to go around the system and find a way through. And if you could, can't go through, you've got to go over or around it. So um, uh, starting with Gene, then we'll go to Mark and then, and then uh, Carolina will bad uh, clean up here. Uh, Gene, from what you're hearing here, is this, is this pretty typical of what small business had to do, especially uh, small businesses owned by communities of color uh, or, or women owned? Yes, it, 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 much, it very much is. Um, I'm Gene Cornelius, I'm the senior director at the Region Center for Regional Economics at the Milken Institute, but I'm also the former uh, deputy administrator of SBA for 20 years. And I can tell you that she pointed out the four major things that people had to go through um, during this crisis and, and any crisis really. And one is first look at their capacity Look at the impact that this disaster or whatever you want to call it has on your customer base. Look at the diversity of your customer base and then be flexible. She was very, very candid about how she had to move and maneuver and flex. She went from laying off, um, downloading a percentage of her staff and downgrading hours to all the way to layoffs. And she did that based on her customer uh, base and her diversity. And then she reinvented herself. She said, okay, this is 
pre-COVID, and this is what I did, here's what I need to do now and currently, and, and what resources and assets do I have available, and how does that transcend to something new? And, and, then, the, and then the fourth thing she did, which was definitely important, is uh, tenacity. She hung in there. She, she went and, and went after everything, no matter what she thought the constraints was that were out there. And I, I think that uh, uh, in her story, I think she really laid it out what those who have survived have done. 41% uh, of black businesses won't be coming back because of the very four things that she just mentioned. 41%? I'm sorry? 41%? 41%, yes, it, it, it's amazing. And when you look at the SBA outside of PPP, you're only talking about 4% going to African-Americans. You're talking about less than 8% uh, going to Latino communities. It, it, when you're talking about the 7A program, she mentioned SBA's different projects. That's the 7A working capital project. But when you look at the 504, those that facilitate inventory and facilities and things like that, that's 2%. And, and it gets down to less than 10% for Latino community. So, so this participation is important. And what it really boils down to, which she nailed, was that these banks and these communities don't have relationships. So when the PPP program came aboard, those people who had banking relationships and those banks who were already preferred lenders in the SBA program had the upper hand and they were able to do that. And then in our small businesses, we're so busy trying to meet that daily payroll and cash flow that we are not really keeping the adequate tax records. We're not really keeping the numbers that are necessarily for what what is necessary to get into these programs and, and get an advantage and get into the first line of these programs. So that tsunami just hit the minority and people of color community. Now, having said that, even absent of that, what COVID has done is really pulled back the sheet on it, uh, in institutional uh, unconscious bias in the underwriting program. If you are basing your underwriting on net worth and people of color and women are well below white males in net worth, they already entered at a disadvantage before the disaster even happened. And if you are using things to make that loan, such as collateral and the like, and their housing values are being redlined and, and, and all these other things that have kept down the value of their homes, their ability to get capital has diminished just by that in itself. And then you have to look at all that coming into to play. And one of the things that I did um, early on was on the first round, when she mentioned the first round of PPP and the second round, I wrote an article that was published in CNN about that. And, and I pushed for the second term, the second round to go to community banks and CDIFs that were serving our communities. And, and fortunately, they did take note to that and they did do that in the second round. And so, the, 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 but there was no one at the table in, in that administration that looked like me because we all left SBN a lot. And, and there was no one to guide them in the first round to say, you can't do this with the big boys. You got to go to the, the CDIS and, and the like. And so this created a windstorm inside the tsunami. And, and that is why we have the situation we have with less than 2% of VC capital going to people of color and less than 1% going to women. That's outside of loans. And so when you look at investments and you look at loans, then you have this tsunami and you have this thing. So what do we do about it? And let me be quick and I'm gonna to get to the other panels. What do we do about that? We have to go in as the service providers. We have to be the ones on the ground that go in and really focus on financial literacies to these mom and pop organizations. We have to get them to understand their behavior and their actions that sets them up against these underwriting principles. 
we have to get them to understand how important it is to keep those financial papers and those tax papers and to put the equity in their home and to do all the things that when this happens again, those natural constraints, those unconscious bias of underwriting constraints are out of the way. Thanks so much. Uh, um, I'll bring on Mark next uh, and please introduce yourself. It sounds like you know, uh, it's it, it's a race, but it's not an even race. That a lot of folks started way, way, way back, and were expected to compete, and uh, and no one cared uh, when you did start. Uh, so, Mark, if you're if you're off mute, uh, please introduce yourself and, and and just tell me a little bit about about some of these numbers we just heard. Forty one percent of black owned businesses will be gone. Yes, and uh, thank you, Nigel. Mark Robertson, president of Pacific Coast Regional Small Business Development Corporation uh, in Los Angeles. We are. In fact, just beginning our 45th year of operation, uh, we're a community development financial institution, uh, which Gene mentioned. That's one side of our operation. And, and be before I go on, let me just uh, applaud uh, Lenore in, in her uh, story uh, for her everything that she was going through, running a business, uh, a one-year-old child, pregnant. Uh, she had the 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 audacity, if you will, to start a nonprofit to help other small businesses. Uh, Lenore, you, you should contact the SBA and see whether or not they need another small business development center in San Francisco. You are just fantastic. Um, but yes, we are a community development financial institution uh, at PCR. And what that means is uh, we provide uh, community development loans. We've got about uh, five different small business loan programs that we administer that allow us to make loans anywhere from $500 up to $650,000. In addition to which we administer the state of California loan guarantee program that allows us to pr provide a loan guarantee of up to two and a half million dollars. So pretty much whatever the financing need a small business has, uh, we can try to, to work with them and get them uh, the funding that they need. On the other side of our shop, we're a small business development center in SBDC uh, in collaboration with the SBA uh, where we provide one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching and counseling as well as uh, classroom with these days webinar uh, training for entrepreneurs. And our, our SBDC really came to the fore uh, in the pandemic. Uh, uh, and yes, Nigel, it is 41% of African-American businesses uh, that will not come back, uh, but we made it a point to, uh, particularly uh, with our lending activity during the pandemic, we participated in both rounds of PPP lending. We're not a large shop, uh, but we were able to fund uh, just about 400 uh, PPP loans in both rounds. Uh, for about $8 million. So our average loan was $20,000. So we were targeting the very small uh, underserved businesses and just about 70% of the loans that we made were to entrepreneurs of colors, uh, pri primarily uh, black and brown uh, businesses. Our, our SBDC, um, you mentioned Nigel that our paperwork was not in order and too often that is the case, but the SBDC, uh, that is what we're here for. Uh, if a business, does, a business owner does not have their paperwork in order, uh, we will sit with them uh, and work with them to uh, uh, um, combine all the necessary documents necessary uh, to uh, apply for whether it's a PPP loan, uh, whether it's a grant program, or whatever it is they're, they're seeking, uh, we'll work with, with them in doing that. Uh, while PCR was only able to fund internally some $8 million uh, in PPP loans, our SBDC worked with uh, several thousand additional borrowers and placed them with other lenders for just about $60 million in PPP funding. So uh, we target uh, as a CDFI, we have committed to the U.S. Treasury that everything that we do, at least 60% of it, will be with African American and Latino owned businesses. So, uh, yes, the numbers are dire, uh, but we're here to, to make sure that the, those businesses, those that want to come back, are able to come back 
and we're working with them in doing just that. Uh, one of the things that we're doing, uh, particularly in the SBDC, is it, there's a realization that revenues may not be what they were pre-pandemic. So in order to uh, get financing, businesses need to be comfortable with uh, doing projections, uh, projecting where their business is going, uh, what revenues will look like at some point in the future. And for that matter, lenders need to be uh, comfortable with uh, working with projections and believing and trusting in the entrepreneur that they're going to do what they say uh, they're going to do. Uh, Gene mentioned about collateral and, and, and uh, net worth. Those things have been decimated uh, oftentimes with our borrowers. So we're going to all have to get comfortable with both providing uh, projections to our lenders and lenders will have to get comfortable in using those projections if they want to make loans going forward. Uh, there, there, was, uh, there was a couple things that, uh, that Lenore mentioned that I wanted to, to touch on. Um, I, I think that um, you mentioned about going, going around the system and, and not being able to access uh, traditional lenders. Uh, this pandemic is where CDFIs, Community Development Financial Institutions, really came uh, to the fore uh, to fill that void. Uh, we have the ability to uh, make loans, to be more flexible, to be more creative, uh, and to meet the businesses where they are. We don't have to rely on just the trad traditional underwriting uh, guidelines. Um, oftentimes you'll, you'll hear someone who didn't qualify because of a credit history. Well, PCR has worked with uh, credit histories as low as 600. That is our threshold. And will we go lower than that? We certainly have, but it's on a, on a case by case basis. So we don't uh, solely depend on the traditional underwriting guidelines uh, that lenders uh, rely on so often. Uh, and they have to because their banks are regulated. Uh, CDFIs and other uh, non-traditional lenders have a bit more wherewithal to uh, get money in the hands where they are, where it's needed most. Sure. Um, th thanks so much, Mark. Um, Carolina, uh, bringing you on to pinch it here. Uh, this sounds like everyone got a kind of a financial literacy, uh, financial literacy test all at once and you know, maybe didn't have really a chance to study up beforehand. Uh, what did you see um, in, in this pandemic, especially as it applies to, to Latino businesses? Thank you. And I have to apologize. My dog has been barking for the last five minutes and I don't wanna move from here. So I'm sorry for the background, but um, yes, actually, I think this is such a great way to see all aspects of what happened with this pandemic for a small businesses. So hello, and my name is Carolina Martinez. I'm the CEO of Cameo. We're a statewide network of resource partners um, that provide technical assistance and capital to the various small businesses, especially in underserved communities. So a small business development centers, um, women's business centers, independent nonprofits, and mission-based lenders are part of our network. Um, Cameo's network is over 300 uh, resource partners that are serving around 84,000 small businesses a year. Um, so uh, what Leonor mentioned at the beginning is exactly what we started hearing, right? And uh, when all this happened uh, and we were really seeing that the small businesses were uh, struggling to understand what to do, and then a lot of programs started coming up and understanding what to apply for, how to apply, what do we need? Um, it was a challenge uh, for everybody. So uh, all our network became first responders. We kept th saying that uh, at some point we just um, started thinking that the same way that our health workers were doing such a great job trying to help with COVID, recovering the hospitals and keeping everybody in house, uh, they consultants, uh, Mark's staff were just all the time out there working with the small businesses from home. So the big difference before when we were working with underserved communities with minority groups 
was our um, hands-on approach, right? Like we were able to connect with them in person. So rethinking how to get to them to help them navigate this was a big challenge because not everybody was digital savvy. We, nobody was really ready to move to Zoom or to Teams or to any, any of the no, numerous programs we currently have, but we needed to reach them and we needed to also understand what these programs were. So when Leonor was talking about PPP, is like, are we eligible? That was the first question. The CDFIs, are they eligible to be offering these PPPs? Uh, initially, they were not, right? Uh, so we actually saw that as a big challenge because we definitely got our Latino businesses, our African-American businesses, our um, communities of color really affected and women-owned businesses really affected by the fact that they were not sure how to apply or where to apply. They were not ready to connect with the banks. Um, and then when the CDFIs came on board, we saw the need for capital, right? Like, how could we actually have the liquidity for the CDFIs to really help them? So um, we, we are sort of seeing a lot, and, and the numbers that you're sharing here is exactly what happened. We know that women-owned businesses actually received 5% of the PPP loans. That was 5%. That's nothing, right? We know that's definitely not representative. Uh, and we know that around 12% of the Black-owned businesses and Latino-owned businesses were the only ones that received the full amount they requested for PPPs. So the very few that were able to get funding most likely were not even receiving the full amount. And um, so one of the things that uh, really challenged us uh, as we were moving to towards this pandemic is nonprofits were also trying to figure it out for themselves. So exactly what Leonor was mentioning about her small business, everybody was trying to help this, the business at the same time, they were trying to stay on business and trying to figure out how to protect their staff and how to find information. Um, so definitely we are saying that um, new programs and it got to a point where we already got settled, but we are definitely uh, understanding that that at the beginning was just chaos. It was really trying to come up with uh, the right hand information and just to give you an example when we put together our first webinar to explain how the eidl which was the um the the recovery loan that lenore was and the, the relief loan that uh, lenore was mentioning it, uh we invited sba to explain it we put together really really easy to use toolkit for the consultants to just kind of check, do a checklist of you, are you eligible or no, if you feel, uh, if you fulfill these uh, points. And we don't do any direct service to the small businesses. Our focus was really, how could we train the consultants to go out and help them? And our cons the consultants in our network just forward the invitation to small businesses. They were like, we are just gonna be wasting time. We need them to hear from you. So our first webinar, which we were expecting around a hundred people end up with almost 5,000 people. And mostly a small business is really concerned about how to apply, how do we qualify? How do we reach out? So that really showed us the need for uh, this they were everybody was hungry from inf for information. And uh, so when I was saying at the beginning that this was a really great way to, to close this is we heard from Lenora at the beginning from the very grassroots, like the small businesses were suffering this. We really saw the perspective of the needs of the communities. The Jane was, you did a great job really sharing what the needs of the entrepreneurs of color were and how challenging it was to connect with banks and technology tools and how the CDFIs were actually out putting products to help. And with what, with what I'm presenting to you, we could really see all that from the perspective of the organization serving and um, just bringing everybody to the table has been the silver lining of all this pandemic because we were and we kept hearing and i'm sure you all heard this that sba and our industry was the best kept secret and we always struggled to really get the word out about how to get to the small businesses with the free services with the consulting with the capital that they need and this pandemic really shone a light of the amazing and important and vital role that CDFIs and technical assistance providers have 
to help entrepreneurs of color and to really, especially in the underserved communities, to really get to them understanding their language, their culture, their situation is like they are part of the community. So we did uh, we did also see, and I want to bring up a lot of bar barriers that really um, brought um, the network uh, to solve internally a lot of challenges and uh, is that there was not communication and it was not easy way to reach a small businesses. So uh, we are an industry that traditionally has not done a lot of marketing. We are very lean. We are really focusing in implementing and using funds to uh, serve the small the, the, the serve the small businesses in underserved communities. But uh, when we moved online, there were a lot of communities that were left out because we did have did not have a way to reach them. So that was very uh, that is still one of the items that we discuss with several funders, with several partners within our is how do we uh, really focus on that in reaching these communities. Also, the digital divide was a serious, uh, like we still have, and I have one of our members as we were doing one of the uh, real life programs that they literally put um, a scanning drive through uh, in the parking lot of the small, of the offices. They couldn't get the small businesses in, so they actually moved the scanner to the parking lot with all the PPE and people were coming through the parking lot to scan documents so they could apply for uh, some of the recovery uh, programs. So understanding those needs of the small businesses, I think is one of the areas where as an industry, we've been able to talk to legislators, to public officials, to funders and say, this is something that we cannot do on our own. Uh, we are really working together as an industry and we need to all come together to really uh, come up with different um, ideas to really reach these underserved communities and these entrepreneurs of color. So we are seeing a lot of coalitions coming up. We are seeing a lot of new innovative programs, but all of that has been really the result of all of us suffering through this year and being extremely flexible to what the small business needs and just working nonstop to figure out what are we actually improved on that so um this is kind of like my summary of this point and um yeah thank you thank you very much <laughs> <laughs> um we have some questions coming in um and i wanted to g did you want to say something oh hold on yes i did i want to say you know we're looking at it, uh, lenora mentioned something else that came up she was talking about the loan versus the grant and and all that, and a part of that financial literacy that we need to also explain to our small businesses as far as their eligibility is how they use their funds and how they calculated those funds. Oh, hey, and, and, and how that is done because, you know, people didn't understand taking two thirds of their payroll between February and June and calculating that and understanding that they could add another 25% on for operating costs for the loans. And people didn't understand that in the grant, how they could get the grants waived and they didn't have to pay it back if they used it on holding on to their, their employees versus laying them off or, or putting them on suspended timeframes and things like that. And the reason I bring this up is because what Colleen just said, and, and I, I appreciate her saying that, you're seeing all these pop-ups and you're seeing all these technical assistants and you're seeing all these providers out there and we're all stovepipe. We're not working together. The small businesses get confused. They don't know who to go to first. And we need to start sending them to the real direct group. And that is the SBDC and the CDIF. If we really are about helping small businesses, we need to send them to the established network that has the arms and the pinnacles that will get them into the doors of the SBA, get them into commerce, get them into the international market. Those people are trained for that. That's what they do. So whose when job? Mark, yeah. To, huh? uh, whose job is it to get that out there? Mark, maybe you could also help with this. Who, whose job is it to actually? Get... I think that's all of our job. I, I think 
I think that it is every one of our jobs for us to be consistent, for us to send the message of where to have a one-stop shop, for us to say, here's where you go first. And when Mark at the SBDC sees that this business is expanded more than his capacity, then he refers them to me, or he refers them to someone else, or he refers them to a higher authority that could help them. But they need a starting point. And what our community has lacked because of all these stovepipes and all these solo technical assistance providers out there putting up shingles is where to go first. And I, I would add um, to that, um, I think that's been the challenge is like, or is the one stop shop for the um, for the small businesses? I think uh, when we had Isabel um, in our go uh, in, here in California, Gobis, that was intended. That was mm -hmm. some of the intention also with the small business relief grant. And uh, Gobis has been playing a, a role on that right now under Tara Gray. But uh, and definitely we were seeing some of the cities, a lot of uh, mayors have been putting out one-stop websites for uh, small businesses to reach out. So I think public officials have been taking a lot of the lead on that. Um, I do feel like it's a shift in the mindset of the industry. And I, I'll keep repeating that. It's just because we are in nonprofits and we are not thinking that we need that marketing or spend that money into that. And I think that's definitely been uh, proved wrong in the past year. Uh, we did have, for example, a program for the PUA, the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance. A lot of self-employed um, businesses had the opportunity to apply for unemployment and they were not aware of it. They thought they were a small business. They didn't, they, why yes. would they have unemployment? Right. So uh, we actually partnered with our foundation to do marketing and get the word out. And we partner with legal assistance to help them apply for that. And we really proved that that needed to happen to get that uh, the word out, to help them as they understand how to fill out the form. Some of them just call and they would fill it out for them. So it is something that we need to really start discussing is like, we, mm -hmm. If we don't do the marketing, the small businesses are going to go to other organizations that might not be the right ones for them. And, and we need to really get that in. To that point, like I wish that um, Isabella had stayed on because she announced this, like uh, she was talking about the hub pilot. And frankly, like uh, respectfully, I think it's been really terrible for anyone who wants to participate in that program. Um, we have desperately been looking for someone we can attach ourselves to as a hub. It's a hub and spoke model. It's called the Community Navigator Pilot. And it's funds so that you can sort of um, like pay smaller grassroots organizations to do the work of, of finding small businesses and helping them access existing resources. Um, it does not provide a lot of money actually. And no one wants to be a hub. We spoke with Cameo attempting to be a hub to their uh, sorry, I spoke to their hub, um, but they were looking for organizations that had a broader reach than just San Francisco. But I think we've probably had 12 calls attempting to find a hub. Um, everyone has just said, hey, go contact your SBDC. The SBDC is unable or something to sort of have conversations with specific organizations about things. So like all of the conversations with them have been quite cryptic, but here we are saying we're willing to do the work. We wanna underwrite the call center that we have that is already providing resources to small businesses in Spanish, Chinese, and with um, like very specific focus on, um, on reaching black entrepreneurs. And like, we can't find anyone who wants to be a hub, who like wants to be the sort of administrator um, to like pass out that SBA funding. And so I think it's because the program was poorly designed. And um, so I think there has to be, if, if like, if what we want is actually to get out there and reach businesses, things have to be different than they are right now. I, I would say like, we are applying as a hub. Um, You're the only person I've been able to find. Yeah, <laughs> it's too. been so we, hard because- oh, you too. are, oh, that's cool, you're, okay. <laughs> And it's been a hard program, but it's a great opportunity. And, and definitely what you're saying, Lenore, is good. The funding is not enough, especially for a state as California. And that is the challenge that we are currently having um, because uh, it, we are only able to apply for 2.5 million. And it's not enough if you want to really reach the communities uh, throughout a state, such a big state like this. 
Uh, so that is definitely a challenge that we're looking at to solve, hopefully in the next few days, because it's pretty close. Well, but I, what I wanted to I, say I'm is- gonna, I'm gonna counter that. I think that SBA did that deliberately um, because they want established funds, they want established companies and firms that have their own money and that already are doing this. And they are doing this as a supplement to that. They are not into it for full funding. They're into it for supplementing what you already do. Yeah, but we're looking for that just, and we can't find me, anyone. Let me just like say, we, we've actually been invited by three potential hubs uh, to be a spoke. Uh, and, and that is, is rather refreshing. And I say that to say that it, at least in Southern California, we've had a, a lot, several very large CDFIs coming into the marketplace here recently. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Lisk and Lendistry and CDC Small Business Finance. Uh, all of these are very large CDFIs and have a lot of capacity. And, and Nigel, this gets back to your question earlier, you know, how do we uh, find the resources? Cameo is, is a perfect uh, convener of the resource providers. Uh, that, that is one answer. Uh, simply by being a member of Cameo, uh, the members know each other, get to know each other, learn how to collaborate and offer services together. Another thing is too, is we receive so many calls by virtue of our relationship with the SBA, so many calls uh, by virtue of businesses going to the SBA website and looking for service providers in their particular area. So uh, I think to the extent the SBA can put itself more out there uh, to market, uh, and let uh, uh, the people know that services are available. Uh, I think that is a, is a win because that's a national uh, uh, program and pretty much anything you, you need, you can get your, your questions answered there and, and get pointed in the right direction. Uh, Lenore, I agree. I also wish you'd been able to ask Ms. Guzman some questions. Uh, unfortunately, that didn't happen, but that's what I was definitely looking for. Uh, folks, let me uh, remind you, please uh, send questions in. We're technically in the Q&A part now. Um, and going back to something we talked about in a minute ago, which is, uh, which is unemployment insurance, I want to read a question from Jeff Cohen. Uh, he said this earlier, small business owners who pay themselves on payroll to provide themselves UI benefits, unemployment benefits, are taxed twice. So very few business owners end up having access to UI benefits. Entrepreneurs are taking a lot of risk, driving a significant part of the economy, while also, also struggling to create their own safety net. Uh, Lenore, I wanna throw it back to you for a minute. What was the UI process like? Did you guys, your employees filed for unemployment, but does this apply to you at all? You're, you're, you're... Um, okay, so, and to be clear, like from the nonprofit, I don't get paid. I've never been paid a cent. And my business does not participate because I felt like it was a conflict since we had hundreds of small businesses that wanted to participate to like funnel any of that money to myself. So we very much are, I mean, everyone's struggling, even people that are participating in our program. Um, okay, for UI benefits. Um, okay, so to, pr to participate in the WorkShare program, which is where you retain employees, and so they get to keep their benefits and stuff, but you um, you put some of their hours on, on WorkShare. Um, that is a pretty annoying process, frankly. You apply weekly, um, which I mean is flexible, so that's kind of nice. Um, you sort of say this week, you know, employee A worked, you know, they, they missed 20% of their normal hours and maybe in week B they missed 30%. And so you can be flexible in that way, which is cool. Um, I will say um, EDD, California EDD was so backlogged that um, there were huge waits for things. So people are getting like a debit card, which was um, I think pretty fine for most people, but you're getting it sometimes six weeks after the end of your pay period. Um, so I know some small business owners who made interest-free loans to their staff and then kind of got that money back when people got paid, but that was a definite pain point. Um, I just didn't pay myself. I never thought about taking unemployment. Um, I, I do know that a lot of entrepreneurs utilize PPP funds to be able to pay their own salary. And so for some people who like laid off staff, but then got PVP, it was not bad because they were able to still pay themselves. So I think that was a win. Um, I think the real challenge is that like, there's not, I mean, the PPP so far is not enough. And if you got PPP, you can't get restaurant stack money. 
So that's not an additional support of any kind. Um, so people are dealing with like a lot of debt. I mean, I, I, and, and I think um, one thing that sort of we touched on, but I think didn't directly name is like, yes, it's a challenge if you're having to use your house as collateral, but like most people I know, like don't have a house. <laughs> Like never could I afford a house in San Francisco. Um, and I think, you know, I'm having to personally guarantee everything. And so if you do have a house, like one challenge of, of people of color and women being disproportionately underrepresented um, with like venture funded businesses is like, if you're venture funded, you don't have to personally guarantee anymore. And so all these small mom and pops are personally guaranteeing loans. And I just spoke with a, a woman who had to close her business during the pandemic. She had applied to be part of our program, but we didn't have any more space. She closed down her business. Her landlord who received a $3 million PPP loan um, still demanded that she pay six months of her rent to get out of her contract on her space. Um, so she ended up having to pay him out and borrow money from her community, from her friends and family to pay this person. Um, so that she wouldn't have to be forced into personal bankruptcy. So like, that's what I'm facing as a small business owner. If I declare bankruptcy for my business, I will have to declare personal bankruptcy. And I think that's something that people really don't understand that small business owners are in this spot. So like finding some that's way- That's a part of the financial literacy I'm talking about. You, mm -hmm. you touched on it. And, mm -hmm. and that's what I mentioned at the beginning of the, our call. We need to educate our small businesses on the financial li literacy. We not only just throwing capital at them and giving them money, but are we throwing the right amount of capital? But it's like, I knew that I was personally uh, guaranteeing things. I don't have yeah. an option. If I want to well, sign a lease and, on and, a space, and, and I have to personally guarantee. Is, is the debt to ratio equivalent on the bottom line? Are we, are we looking at our operational expenses and are we looking at our liabilities and are we giving the loan the right amount? Because we will say that we only need a hundred grand when we really need 250 and we don't know that. And, and that's the financial literacy we have to have. The other thing is we have to understand the use of funds. It, it, when we talk about the use of funds, it's just like you said, with the debt side and the equity side, the, it may not be a loan we want. We may want an investor. We may want an investor with a timeout. We want to have an acquisition plan for to buy them out once their investment is there. Mm -hmm. These are the kinds of things that will stop our small businesses from filing bankruptcy. This will stop our community from not gaining net worth and, and, not, and, and being able to buy that collateral that I'm talking about. This is why we have to focus on not access to capital. There's lots of access to capital and I've never known a bank that doesn't want to make a loan. We have to understand what is in their, our small businesses behavior that is preventing them from dealing with the conventions of that. And that is information. They don't know. They, the financial literacy, what you just said, Eleanor, and what you just went through it takes about six to nine months to get a bit small business to the, to the point of even acknowledging that. But I guess what I'm saying is I, I, I went to Yale. I have a really good yeah, education. I, <laughs> I like, you know, like um, I didn't have any resources growing up, but like I have access to like people that can loan me money and I have the tenacity to like keep going to try to get whatever's available. And even for me, it's a challenge. So I think mm -hmm. in my case, it's not necessarily, I mean, I think at the beginning, sure, like I needed to, to improve my financial literacy. And, and certainly there are some small business owners who, who like really don't have a college, they don't have a college education, they haven't completed high school in some cases. And for those people, yes, it is the most difficult and it's hard for them to find time even to like, to like gain more financial literacy skills. But I guess what I'm saying is even for the people like me, it is challenging <laughs> and especially with the pandemic, like damn near impossible mm -hmm. to keep operating in the current landscape. So well, it, it, it is, but if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. We know that entrepreneurship and this business ownership is difficult. Now the question is, and this is on us, this is on us, the TA providers, this is on us, the community leaders, this is on us, the NGOs. We have to tell that we have to teach them the business acronyms. We have to teach them that before they walk in the door. And, and believe it or not, it's easy to do because if you think 
you, that they don't have some concept of it. I tell you to go to any local minority community and watch the kid on the corner that, that has his hustle. He knows how to do it. Now, the question is, are we transferring the, the conventional language that he's using on the street to the conventional language of business? And, and that's where we have to get involved. And that's where we have to go. Can you elaborate on that just, just, just a little bit? I was going to jump to one of our questions, but but how do you mean translate what I'm assuming you mean, you know, somebody selling whatever to 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 business? Um, are you talking about well, interceding with their young or, or what? What's the sorry? Go ahead. No, the, the, the what I'm saying is there's there's a language transition that from street and from urban communities to the business community. And, and if you say to them financial literacy versus hey man, how much did you end at the end of the day? You know, uh, how much did you spend on that? And how much did you gain at the end of the day? They know that. They don't know that that's cash flow. You know, we have to teach them these language barriers that, that, is, is, that, are, that are stopping the business community of our, uh, the business development of our communities. We have to, you know, when a, when a, a, a woman goes into business and she is sitting there in her business and she's got the babies right there on the side and she has to spend a proportion of that time making sure that that baby's okay before she's in her operation. She has to understand the effect on her pro productivity and what that costs her and, and how she can get a tax write-off on that. We don't teach them that. We, you know, this is, this is things we have to tell our communities and we have to go into that detail and we, and it, and we can't assume that they are not sophisticated enough to understand it because that's not true. I guess even if you, even if you know that stuff, like you still can't get a loan for the first three years you're in business. And, and I well, think yeah, that's, I wanted, you, to, I wanted you, to share with you You can something. get along for the first three years of your business if you know this stuff. As 20 years of giving loans in SBA, I could tell you who can get along in the first year of their business if they walked in the door with that language. We're going to throw it to Carolina, and then we got Mark raising his hand. So um, I think it's, it's so important what uh, both of you are uh, having the conversation right now, because definitely you know, what we see is uh, we are educated people here, and it's hard to actually find the resources and the tools to help you navigate businesses in general, but through this pandemic is even more complicated, right? Okay. Um, so I just wanted to kind of uh, put in some context here. We did um, a, a white paper um, maybe three years ago that is very relevant and it's something that I'd like to bring up because there is not one thing that could really help us, and I think it answers one of the questions in the chat about what can be do, done about POC-owned businesses and help them. And I think when we are really working with a small businesses in underserved communities, with entrepreneurs of colors, and in general, we really need to be sure, be clear about what are the contacts that they have and mm -hmm. how they can really reach those tools. So we, our white paper was about uh, local um, ecosystems and how could build how we can really build thriving ecosystems of support mm -hmm. for these underserved communities, and we came up with the five C's. Uh, it's not the five the, the C's uh, that we are used <laughs> in the lending, so it's different. But we put it there so we could really kind of relate to what it is. And the five C's is the first is coaching is what you're talking, Eugene. We do need to provide those technical assistance. And that is so important for us to really mm. get the small businesses into thinking how to navigate their uh, financials, their business model, their marketing, mm -hmm. all of that. Uh, we also have capital. We need them to have the capital. Either, mm -hmm. and, and I love when you're talking, Lenore, about venture capitalism, because we definitely, in the underserved communities and the small business and entrepreneurs of color, that's not that common. I think that is one of the coaching opportunities we have. Really, we need to teach them about how to reach this venture capital. Like, mm -hmm. well, how could we really help them to pitch their business in a way that they can get some of the capital independent of only grants and debt? So capital in general is important. The third one is connections. One mm -hmm. of the challenges we have with underserved communities is they don't have the connections. When Lenore was talking about her going to jail, that's definitely a network of friends and connections that you could leverage, but that's not the case in the majority of entrepreneurs of colors. 
So how could really build that, those, uh, those networks for that help them? That's what happened with PPP. They had no connections with banks. They had no connections with key investors. But they, they have no you, you're the one stop shop. That's my point. Well, that's what we're working on. And then the fourth one is um, climate. I'm sorry, culture, climate and culture, those are external. So we can't really manage them, but it's mostly with public officials, right? Like how could cities, counties, and state could be more friendly to help small businesses through that transition? And culture is really how could we be friendly to a small businesses to really have the community to go by to the mom and pops small businesses right now to really promote we had a, our board chair had this campaign of 12 days of takeout when the restaurants were really struggling it was everybody really trying to go 12 days you order everything outside so you can help the small businesses mm -hmm. so how could we really build this um this this five c's and we can really build this ecosystem all of us coming together really understanding what the entrepreneurs of color need and that could really be helpful uh for that so just wanted to show that that's great that's Bye. a great that's great mark, mark been very very patient please go ahead <laughs> yeah. well if it's okay nigel I, I wanted to kind of shift i think we we're, we've got a good idea as to where we have been with the pandemic I wanted to kind of shift to, to, to maybe move the discussion to where we are now. Uh, what we're seeing from our clients is that they'll come to us and say, yes, Mark, we're open, but uh, I think Lenore, you mentioned that you're only maybe 20% of your historical revenues. Uh, our clients are, are telling us that there may be 40%, mm -hmm. one or two might be at 60%, but what's happening is that they can't rely on their historical business model. So we need to be asking the question is what else can I do? Uh, um, we've all heard during the pandemic, uh, the word pivot, uh, which kind of drove me crazy, but it's necessary that these businesses be able to figure out something else to do to drive revenues. A perfect example is a, 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 a local soul food restaurant. I won't mention the name, but very, very well-known family. Um, but again, revenues not where they were historically. They came to us and said, we want to do a food truck. So uh, we financed a food truck for this organization, and they're now uh, taking their wares on the road, literally, and, and so this was something else that they figured out to do that would supplement, complement their historical business model. And I think that that is something that uh, PCR is working with our clients to, to help them, you know, even if it's, if they haven't had an online presence, um, uh, working to take their business online so that somehow in the future they can be uh, maybe a little bit more immune to the, to the impacts of the next disaster because there will be other disasters. And for that matter, we're not even out of this one yet by a long shot. So uh, I think it, it's important that we work with them on figuring out what else can, can they do. Sure. What, uh, one thing that, that strikes me is we, we're, we're talking about a ticking clock here, right? I mean, it's not, it's not uh, we can talk about the ideals and, and taking six months or nine months to educate people literally, you know, on, on literacy, but 41%, according to the, the, the Fed, uh, of, of black owned businesses, you know, could, could be gone. That's, that's, that, that, that's astounding. Um, so so what, what kind of emergency measures, is it just, I guess my question is, is it just about government intervention? Is it simply a matter of another round of funding, another round of intervention more directed, or is there anything else that could be done to sort of forestall or prevent what looks like, you know, apocalyptic to, to, to a large segment of these businesses? Uh, I don't think there's anything that could be, that could stop the next, um, Disaster. Disasters happen as a part of of. Well, life. I mean, where we're at right now. What can we do by? Yeah, the I, I think that I, I think that we we have to do this uh, simultaneously. We have to prepare. We have to have access to capital, like Caroline said, out there. But we also have to prepare them on those five C's. I want I want to take what she said because that's 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 exactly what we need to be doing. We need to to quit thinking that we have to do this one thing. 
No, there, there are several things we have to do and we have to do them in coordination with each other. And, and if it takes six months to nine months, then that happens. And, and, and we have to be prepared, but we're at least, even if it happens three months into that six months, we, are, we got them ahead of the game of where they are. And, and we, we have to have that mindset. And if you don't come to them from their culture, if you don't come from their environment, you're going to lose them. And, and, it, it, and, it, and if you don't get into the behavioral science of technical assistance and, and, and educating them in, in what they're already doing, because these businesses are doing it. They're, they're, they're using products, they're making products, they're selling products, and they're making revenue. Now, how do we get them to put that in writing? How do we get them to make historical value of that? How do we get them to get to the point where nine months from now, they're not worried about not being eligible for the PPP loan. They're not worried about not having a bankable relationship. They're not worried about not having the paperwork necessary to be eligible for or to save their cost of capital. They, they, we need to get them there. And we can't pretend or say, oh, we don't have time to do that. We do. We have to do that simultaneously. If I and I would add, if um, obviously we all learn by experience, we are all smarter today than we were a year ago. <laughs> so, uh, and, and and just to share is like a cameo. Personally, we did have a fire in our building around a year, like maybe six months before the pandemic hit, and uh, it was nothing serious, but it got us out of our office for three months, and that forced us to have everything online, to move our files online, to move our QuickBooks. We literally had to stop for a week because we had no access to the majority of our uh, paperwork and to be able to work. And then when the pandemic hit, we were literally ready to go the next day because we had to go over that. And, uh, and I kept saying how ironic that was because we were so upset about having to be out of our office for three months. And then it was kind of got sent to be ready by my March. And I think that's exactly the same thing that is going to happen uh, now. But we have to really make it happen, right? It's not going to come just automatically. We need to really make sure that we are helping businesses to be resilient and ready for whatever comes. We don't know what it is going to come. We have we are not out. We know there is a new variant. We might as well be closing anytime to get back again. So we just need to really be out and helping them get everything as flexible and resilient as possible and get the word out about what resources are available. How could you reach us? There is phone numbers, websites, moving your, your, um, your, your files online, moving your financials. The, the worst part of all everything last time is they couldn't apply for PPP because they didn't have their financial statements that they uh, online, they didn't have their books ready. So can we move everything online? So those kind of things of, of really thinking through how could we create that resiliency and how could we also work on cybersecurity just to be on the safe side, I think is important for them to, to, to start mixing. And what we are seeing right now with moms and pops uh, businesses is they're mixing up the in-person with the digital presence. Mm -hmm. And I think they really need to, I mean, the, the in-person, everybody's really willing and excited to be back together. And I think that's going to be really important for the small businesses. But on the long term, we need to have a, the perfect balance between being able to uh, provide their services online for whatever happens. We do have a lot of fires in California. So even if we go, we are we know there are regions of California that have to have to close. Uh, a month or more a year because there is a lot of fires the quality of the air people can't go out so i think one of the learnings of this and i keep going to silver linings i i i, I always try to take everything in opportunities <laughs> but i think is really how could we get everybody and i tell you cybersecurity was one of the webinars that we've offered several times and if we got five people that was too much nobody mm -hmm. wanted to go <laughs> only people wants to go when they need it and it's too late so the silver 
lighting is we're considering all of this. We should be looking into these key trainings, these uh, technical assistance, these key consulting services to get the businesses ready for whatever comes. Okay, we've got time. Thank you very much. We've got time for probably one more question. Now, I'm going to ask our glorious panelists to keep their answers kind of short because we got about five minutes left. This is coming from Sandy Shove, and it actually um, relates to, to what Carolina was just saying. She says, my business is a solopreneurship by design, and I have no plans to expand beyond this model. Because of that, I'm leery of taking on even low interest loans, although I did take mm -hmm. apply for and receive a small EIDL at, that Lenore described earlier. What are non-debt methods of quote unquote disaster proofing my one woman business? Lenore, what would you tell her? Disaster proof. <laughs> uh, ha, ha. I think it really depends on what your business is, but um, typically you don't want to have all of your revenue tied up in one customer or one type of customer. So mm -hmm. diversifying the types of things you're doing. Um, I think also sort of thinking ahead to the new ways that people are going to be consuming things. Again, it's hard to know without, you know, knowing more about the type of business that you have. But um, I do think that if you can offer a product or service online, you have more flexibility and lower costs. Um, and then disaster proofing. I mean, some, some, I mean, having, having like a nest egg of cash is helpful. So I guess if you can build that up somehow, um, you can also look to like zero interest things like Kiva. Um, or like I started my business on Kickstarter initially. I raised $10,000 on Kickstarter and that's how I started my company. So you could um, look to things like that where you don't have to pay back. Mark, disaster proofing, what is your advice? You know, I'm not sure that there is uh, a way to disaster proof a business. Even those businesses that were deemed essential businesses, uh, even their revenues fell off. So. Uh, I think to the extent that you can, uh, as Lenore mentioned, get non non debt capital into the business, that is always a help. I think the the problem though is your business will grow very slowly if you don't step out and take on some debt. So uh, mm -hmm. I think that I, I'm not sure that it's possible to grow a business without some sort of financing that way. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but again, I don't believe that it's possible to disaster proof a business unless you're, uh, what net, what network are we? Are we on Zoom today? Mm -hmm. I think that one has gone up. Uh, so to the extent that you're in some sort of a high tech uh, uh, business that requires, uh, that people will need during a, a disaster, um, you know, we're just gonna have to hang in there together. Carolina, are there five C's for disaster proofing your business? Um, I think they are. I mean, what I would say is I, I agree with Mark. I think it's really hard to tell you you are going to be able to prote completely protect your business because we don't mm -hmm. know what's coming. And w the businesses that were successful during this pandemic might not be the ones successful in the next, right? So it all depends of what kind of business you have. But I do want to say that is uh, the five C's definitely help you in terms of first understanding that you're not alone. Um, one of the things is uh, really getting uh, guidance support. It's important um, because obviously like you have different perspectives that could help you uh, determine what is the best route of action for your business. Um, and I, I feel like it is important for you. I like the recommendation of some crowdfunding. Usually when you are very small, that is a really good way to start getting some capital. Um, Kickstarted, as Lenore mentioned, but there is also different app, other app platforms that you could get. And a lot of the consultants within the SPDCs and independent nonprofits could help you through those campaigns um, if you don't want to get any debt. There is also a lot of uh, grants coming out uh, from different counties that could really be good for you to be attend uh, applying for. Um, and I would say there is, uh, I think the, the majority of the capital products that have coming have come up as a recovery are debt um, related. So uh, that is definitely something to keep in mind. One of the good things is that this interest have been fairly low. And right. some of them, like the San Francisco one, the, the California Rebuilding Fund launch one in San Francisco, in partnership with the city of San Francisco at 0% loans, uh, 0% interest. So you might have to pay back, but that's the next best thing 
uh, compared to grants, right? Like you have to pay back, but you don't have to pay any interest, right? So that could definitely help you with that. Got it. And so Jean, the time value of money, you're making money on that zero percent interest loan, right? Like that's right. you should take that loan. Yeah, if you think <laughs> about it, yeah. Right. So you definitely want when you when you talk about risk mitigation, because that's what you're talking about. You want to look at like Lenora said, your type of business. And is there products available for you, such as business dis, uh, insurance, business disruption insurance? Um, that could be a plus, and it could be a low cost plus for you. You want to look at, you, I, I would mark, I, you can't avoid all risks. The only way to avoid all risks is to not get into business. Um, but you can mitigate your risk by looking at products that will bring you down. You have to, you have to divert, di diversify not only your customer base, but also where your customers are. Let's say there's a, you got all your customers in Northern California and there's a fire, then all your customers are affected. Um, you need to diversify not just who is your customer, but where are they located? So that is, is one in a fire zone, is one in a hurricane. Uh, if something happens, is there a backup that you can go to the other customer? Uh, you you want to look at things like that. You want to look at what is your operating cost? What is really fixed cost and what is variable cost? What do you have that you can maneuver or you can reduce without decreasing your productivity? Uh, you you want to look at things like that. Is there is not only is there a way to do this? Is there a way to do this cheaply or cheaper? Or is there a way to reduce the time that's necessary that I spend on this? Those are risk mitigating factors that you would want to look at um, before taking debt. Folks, I was worried we wouldn't have enough to talk about. We are at 1.30, we clearly did. Thank you all, everybody, for uh, showing up today and for hanging in here uh, to our wonderful panelists. Thank you guys so much for participating and for uh, everything you had to say. I learned a heck of a lot. And I'm gonna follow up on the Community Navigator thing, Lenore. That's very interesting. I'm, I'm surprised that it wasn't working out and it seems like it could be a story. So everybody get something out of this. Um, all right, guys, well, thank you so much. All right, thank you.